Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I mean, some people, they really want to see all the numbers. They're enthusiasts and they're, they may be particularly paranoid about heart disease or might have something in the family. So although mm. you're sure they're healthy, they're low carbers, their trig HDL ratios are good, you can never say never. So they like yeah. to dig deeper. And you're Probably. a metric kind of guy. To a point, but equally, I think it can be overdone. It, my personal thing, and, and obviously I work on behalf of Irish Heart Disease Awareness to promote the calcification scan for middle risk, middle aged mm. people. But again, that's not for people who are really low risk in the bloods. Yeah. And it's not for people who are really high risk in the bloods, because to be honest, those guys, you have to assume they have a problem coming. Yeah. But for the big middle risk where the bloods are ambiguous and it's not certain, that group you'll find the huge disease people or the zero disease people yeah so that's what i would say is just get a scan it's a hundred dollars and find out well how i've much actually yeah. yeah i actually do use the cac the coronary oh, artery in australia calcium. it's oh, not yeah. that common oh no, I, I use it a lot excellent um, but um it's interesting because if you actually have a look at the way it's calculated there's a much more accurate way of getting a calcium score but the algorithm has actually been patented so it's actually, if you have a look at the literature, it, it's uh, if you ever wondered why, if you have a, people have a, a scan, maybe in close sequence for, for whatever reason, the numbers jump around a little bit. There's a lot of random noise down the low levels of the coronary artery calcium score. And that's mm. because it takes a peak of calcium and then it multiplies it by a certain area and that could be soft plaque or whatever. And it doesn't truly at low levels, I think, or sensitively reflect calcium change. And I think in terms of risk, prediction, I think it's worthwhile having a coronary artery calcium score because you want to know if you're super high or you're quite low. But if somebody's quite low, I will then monitor their progress with CIMT rather than with a coronary artery calcium score. But your other point though at the calcification true, it's really, are you a zero or very low? Are you up in the hundreds? Uh, mm. Depending on your age, are you like substantial or are you really high? They're the guys we want to catch. Um, so in fairness, the CIMT to monitor your month to month progress, calcium more every couple of years yeah, for yeah. a highly diseased yeah. person or every six, seven, eight years for someone who's low. Just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources. Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. Mm. Uh, if you get uh, people should be getting the volume and density as well from the calcium scan often they just get the agates done the rolled up exactly and that's yeah. the standard report that we get we just mm. get the agates and score really and um very rarely will we actually get a graphic yeah but i believe nearly any scenario you can actually ask for the volume and density and generally get it yeah. the cimt there are papers out though very recent ones that the predictive power of CIMT for future events is, appears to be very weak. Yeah, and that's generally. why I do it to monitor progress. And Relative. Not, and, not, and not, yeah, so yes. compared to where you were before, rather than as an initial risk predictor. I think the coronary artery calcium mm. is the best for risk prediction if you're looking at a, a, an investigation tool like that. Yeah, and the C, but the CIMT is a really dynamic kind of which way are you heading in, in a dynamic well, you, way? Well, you, you, you should only use certain sonographers. Now, it's actually quite easy. I've got an in-rooms ultrasound and mm. the, you, you can see how it is easy to make mistakes. So what you want to do, you want to find a landmark um, like the carotid artery bifurcation and then you go up say three centimeters or an absolute fixed point and you have to zoom in, you have to measure it, you have to be meticulous that you're in the exact same location and you come in on the same angle um, and, you have, and you have to use the calipers on the screen to mark it precisely. And I mean, I actually look, so I've got in your rooms ultrasound and I occasionally do it 
um, in rooms if I'm not running late. But um, I use, the sonographers I use for it are guys who I trust. Yeah, you have a very special scenario where you're taking your, your error and, and tightening it really tight. On average, CIMT, people wander into a hospital, get a CIMT. I mean, the operator's clicking where he sees the, the borders. Yeah. It's going to maybe be If you have the same over. person do it every time, even if there is an error, it systematizes mm. the error. So it, it makes it reproducible, if not entirely accurate. Yes, exactly. So you, to be quite honest, Paul, you're a very special advanced application of CIMT from what you described there compared to the generic. If someone walks in the door and gets a CIMT, you know, an Acme CIMT company, God knows what they'll get. But anyway, That's, yeah. yeah. So um, we were talking then about, oh, the LDLPs. Uh, so the LDLP then, you would have this massive range of markers you're measuring, uh, the size, the density, the subfractions, you're looking at LP little a, you're looking at the whole picture as we described mm. earlier. So to our hypothetical person with a 2200 who's healthy versus a 2200 person who's, who's seriously unhealthy, you're gonna be able to tell one from the other with all the other measurements you're looking at. Well, theoretically, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, you just plug that in. And so let's take HbA1c as, a, as an example measure where you really need to interpret it in context. So HbA1c is where you have hemoglobin that has sugar attached to it. And we know that that's, you know, compared to cholesterol, it's probably a better marker of cardiovascular disease because it reflects glycation. But every so often, you'll see one that will be really high or really low. And it'll be incongruent with the rest of the risk factors. And in that situation, what often happens is I go looking and I'll come up with a reason why the HbA1c will be wrong. So, for instance, if you have really rapid cell turnover, if you have a condition, a, a lot of oxidation in your body causing hemolysis, uh, destroying of the red blood cells, then you've got a, a fresh population of red blood cells that haven't had time for sugar to attach, so your HbA1c will be lower. Or if you have iron deficiency or any uh, what we call a hematinic deficiency where the turnover of red blood cells is slower, well, this is something that we often see in thalassemia conditions. So. Um, you know, people from Middle East or the Mediterranean region ancestry, um, their cells turn over slower, so their HbA1c will be artificially high. Um, so, and you only know that by you have a look at these other markers in their blood. You say, oh, ferritin's good, you know, ALT's nice and low, you know, your uric acid's doing this, and you have a look at the whole profile of their biochemistry, and then you say, no, I. I disagree with that HbA1c, but I mean that because it is such a powerful marker, we sometimes have to resist the tendency or the urge to put all our all our you know mm. balls in one basket. Yeah, I think A1c is is great, but as Dr. Kraft said, it failed its component in the sense that it can be misleading at mm. certain times compared to a postprandial insulin or and something. And most people don't understand it. And mm. I mean, what I, I try and control for it, I do a surrogate marker, which is fructosamine, ah, which is looking yes. for glycation of protein. And the most dominant protein in the serum is albumin, obviously. Mm. That's got a half-life, uh, I think, about 21 days. So you compare that to the half-life of red blood cells. So that will give you more immediate red um, glucose levels over the shorter period but the trouble is the reference ranges um, we use in Australia from my lab are just absolutely horrible so I've actually got to sit down I, I've probably got a thousand of them now or something like that and I really need to sit down and try and work out my own reference ranges because I, I can't trust what's in the literature right you need to know what's good bad and indifferent uh, but mm. at least you're triangulating the a1c with the fructosamine and and getting to a better judgment. That's what it's all about, always using... Multiple data points. Multiple I mean, that, as you said earlier, yeah. Yeah, that's the way to go. And the, of course, the continuous glucose monitors and postprandial measurements of your blood glucose is another good way to guess at whether you've got high spikes in blood game glucose. Game changer. That's yeah, been an absolute yeah. game changer. So it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I, we could talk for hours just about that, but um, for people understanding the personal effect on their metabolism in terms of blood sugar levels of the food they're ingesting, I mean, a lot of people come in and say, how many carbs can I have, 20 grams or 30 grams? God only knows. But I tell you what we'll find out is the blood yeah. glucose monitor. And it will also show us a couple of other interesting points. So I mentioned before that glycation um, leads to oxidative stress. 
it can uh, lead to generation of reactive oxygen species. Mm. So we know that fluctuations in your blood sugar level are far more deleterious than a stable blood sugar level. And that's even true. If you have a flat blood sugar level that's higher, that's potentially less harmful than somebody who's got an average blood sugar of lower but is spiking all over the place. And that's where a CGM will give you information that an HbA1c will not. Yes, even though the two are loosely related by equations, the other that one is much more dynamic and showing you what's mm. happening. So I want yeah. stability. Now I, mm. and sometimes occasionally what we see is, and I don't fully know the reason, I suspect it's uh, um, in athletes um, because of their, uh, their need for sugar for anaerobic exercise, especially the anaerobic athletes, when they go on a healthy diet, their sugars will flatline, but it will just tend to kick up a notch. And, and I'm not concerned about that. Exactly. And there's many people who are going keto and low carb. Their A1Cs are okay, but they're often getting fasting blood sugars up near 6 millimole. Well, fasting and is is the least useful, I think, true, of the glucose measures. But there's a lot of excitement and fuss about running a blood sugar that's a little higher than the ideal low one. But yeah. that phenomenon occurs a lot with people who are eating really healthy, low carb diets. They don't have the glucose spikes. You want them to be flatlined. If they're not, if then, to... if they, if they might start out at a five or something, sure. But if they don't go beyond five point five when they have a meal, couldn't really care. Uh, that's it. Or even if they're averaging at five point four, but it only goes mm. up to five point eight after a meal. Mm. It's the postprandial spikes that are the main problem. Yeah. And also. The, the beauty of the HOMA index, if your blood glucose is a little higher, but stable, as you say, right, mm. you've really got to look at your ins insulin. If your blood glucose is a little high, but stable, and you're running really high insulin, you've got a problem and the higher glucose may be something to worry about. But if you're running a really low insulin and you're this type of person, yeah, a healthy person with a higher but flat blood glucose, it's okay. Well, I have I'm to be saying, honest. I, I... Several years ago, I was using the Homer. It was actually the Homer IR2. It's noisy. And um, but I've actually found it not that useful. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, so I, I do a modified craft assay on most of my patients. And that's where I, yeah, I've got about 500 of them now. Wow. Um, and it's relevant for us because craft was described using 100 gram bolus of glucose. And in Australia, we just do 75 grams. So it's actually been quite interesting. For, uh, I've sort of had to come up with our own normative data on our patient population mm. and is um, that working with Catherine Croftson or you're doing that knowing yourself separately? No, that's just, uh, well mm. I will liaise with Catherine I mean we've had conversation about sharing our data with her and letting her crunch all the numbers mm. um, as far as I know I've in as least in Australia I don't know of anybody else who's done more than more than we have um, mm. 500 that's a lot and you're doing when you say modified you're not doing the full five hour no, 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 no. two hour two hours is enough two yes. hours is enough I think it, you, you you can distinguish between all the all the different profiles within two hours of data but what we also do and it's really important is you throw in a half an hour measure because if you're mm. healthier your insulin peak will be closer to half an hour even 20 minutes yes. um, and obviously the insulin peak um, the the worst metabolic health you have, then that gets pushed back. Yes. So that first phase, sharp insulin response, is actually quite meaningful. Oh yeah. If, yeah, it, yeah. if it ha if it if they have a big spike at half hour and it drops by one hour, hey, that's nice. You've got a you know good release of bolus stores of insulin and good capacity, and then you're back to normal, and you very rarely have overshoot. Yeah, and that's Kraft didn't focus so much on that particular phenomenon. Um, he focused more on the one, two, three, four, five mm. hours. The way he put it was, if you're ambiguous at two hour, if you're between thirty and forty micro units, then maybe the third and fourth hour can help. But I don't think he focused so much on the on the first. One half thing hour. that I really mm. actually do like is uh, I get patients to wear a continuous glucose monitor. I think ah. after two hours. I don't really care about the insulin so much, but the glucose, because you will often see a delayed reactive hypoglycemia. Mm. And that, that's not uncommon at three hours. And we pick that up on the CGM trace. Yeah, that's nice. Now, of course, if you do a full insulin assay, you're going to pick it up too, because you're going to do three, four, five hours glucose and yeah. insulin. But who wants to Nobody do that? Nobody wants to do that. Yeah, yeah. it's too um, much. Too you know, much. when I say, oh, you've got to take two hours out of your day, you know, most mm -hmm. people uh, look like I've just uh, eaten their lunch or something, you know. Exactly, <laughs> like, What, you just yeah. do what? <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I mean, Meridian Valley Labs in the US, they have a, a blotter where you can do a full five hour test, but you can just do it in the comfort of your own home with a blotter. Okay. You get your insulin glucose on blood drops on a cardboard ah. sheet. That is pretty sexy. And yeah, I think yeah. it's pretty cheap, but you're right. No way are going to hooked up to a machine for a few hours. Well, I'm sort it. of, you know, universal healthcare in Australia. I mean, this is all, uh, you know, if it's medically indicated, which most people come into me with metabolic derangements, it is. It's covered mm. by the Medicare. That's fantastic. Hey, hey, hold on a minute. We're we're sitting in America as we talk. We're in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, you you sound I'm not like just socialist. Trying to, I'm not trying. <laughs> I am actually, yeah. <laughs> but um, quiet here. Oh, there's a, a knock at the door. I think it's immigration. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think anyone heard us. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left.